And we now turn overseas to the Ukraine, where the crisis intensifying. At least 45 people have died in the latest battle between pro-Russian forces and the Ukrainian military. The fight broke out near Donetsk airport in Eastern Europe. Authorities say so far the deadliest outbreak of violence in their city earlier today. I spoke with Professor Matthew Schmidt of the University of New Haven. He spoke to me via Skype uh, from Ukraine, where he has traveled to monitor the presidential election. And Matthew, before we even get into the election um, and some of the questions surrounding it, um, there was obviously uh, the reports uh, of violence that have happened um, at another part of the country uh, where, in fact, right, I think, at the second most, uh, uh, the second largest airport in the nation, uh, there's reports of more than 100 dead um, and uh, some of those uh, separatist rebels um, were killed in, in large numbers by the government. Um, and I know from where you are, uh, there is connections from the community um, to some of the folks that are on the ground there. Talk a little bit about what you heard. Yes, there are connections between the city I'm in, Dnipropetrovsk, and uh, the cities uh, where uh, the violence is going on, particularly the airport outside of Donetsk. Uh, Donetsk is about three hours by car from here. We're in the, the neighboring administrative region. Uh, I can tell you that, that, first of all, during the election, there was a, a fairly widespread but low-grade concern about uh, some kind of attack happening here in the city. But thankfully, it didn't happen. Uh, and part of what ha happens here is that many of the non-uniformed pro-Ukrainian fighters that are in Donetsk right now come from this city. They organize here. This is where they receive training money, weapons, and this is where they deploy from. And what they have done inside the city, those that are left, there's about 600 uh, in this battalion, uh, so-called the, the Dnieper Petrovsk Battalion. And they have set up a cordon outside of this city and then at the, at the borderline between this administrative region and Donetsk. So in fact, it stayed very quiet here during the election and there were no incidents, but there was considerable nervousness. How much do you think that this election was, in fact, really representative of where the electorate is right now in Ukraine? Well, the OSCE already gave its preliminary report and said that this was a free and fair election. It was reflective of the will of the Ukrainian people. Tell the folks at home who this new president is, um, and he's regarded by many here as more of a practical player although he's already called the separatists, uh, he's made them akin to Somali pirates. Talk about uh, both him, he's an interesting character in his own right, um, and, what, right. Uh, and what really lies ahead for him and what practically can actually broker to get done here. Sure. His name is Pietro Poroshenko, and he's known here as the Chocolate King because he, uh, he's sort of like the Hershey of Ukraine and Russia, actually. And so he is worth something like uh, just shy of one and a half billion dollars. Um, so he was elected president of Ukraine in, in the first round, which was very important. So the decision has been made. He's completely elected. We don't have to come back here in June and do this over again. And what he has said is that his, his first priority is to secure the country. So he has indicated that he was going to push back hard on the separatists which apparently he has done today with this attack on the airport, uh, and that his you know, next priority is to rebuild the economy of Ukraine, which is doing very poorly, and to move closer to Europe. My expectation would be that uh, a backroom deal was made with Putin, between uh, Putin and Poroshenko, and Putin has agreed to accept Poroshenko as president in Ukraine, and I think what you'll find in a, in a, that, that Poroshenko has to look, he has to appear hard on the separatists. And so he will engage in this kind of fighting for a while to see if he can successfully quash this rebellion. And then there'll be an agreement where Poroshenko will say to the Ukrainians, we're going to create a system of decentralization where we will allow every administrative region in the country more autonomy. Putin will take that back to his press and his people, and he will call it something different. He won't call it decentralization. He'll call it federalization. And he'll explain it to his people as, as Poroshenko has given Donetsk and Luhansk uh, autonomous status inside of Ukraine. 
I don't think that that will be true. I don't think that Poroshenko can afford to give these regions real autonomous status. But I think they've come to some kind of agreement about the vocabulary to be used. Matthew, obviously, uh, you knew this region very well um, before this most recent trip. Yet I'm curious, from your perspective, um, having now witnessed the election firsthand and really put faces to a lot of the voices that we got back here, are you more hopeful um, or more nervous about the future of the Ukraine post-election? No, I'm cautiously hopeful. There is a sense in a country of people taking real pride in this question of building up a true and transparent democracy. And I think that's going to stick, especially in the younger generation. Uh, you know, my concern is what happens when the Ukraine does not get let into the European Union or into NATO right away. And when that disappointment sets in for a lot of the population, I, I worry about their reaction at that point. Well, uh, Matthew, I appreciate you giving us a few minutes here, um, and uh, we will talk when you return. Again, Matthew Schmidt, thank you so much. You're welcome. See you soon. And again, that uh, was Matthew uh, from the Ukraine earlier today. When we come back, we switch gears and we take a look at marriage equality. Up next, I'll have a conversation with Joe Becker, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who speaks openly about same-sex marriage in her new book, she was able to have unfettered access for four years to the attorneys who brought the case all the way to the Supreme Court. What she has to say about same-sex marriage and civil rights, straight ahead. <laughs> 